We haven't done enough focusing on George Pickens and what he did for the Pittsburgh Steelers this past season as a rookie. Lots of excitement about what he did, but how can he get sharper? Because there were a lot of things he did with it were very good. We'll talk about this with Noah Strackbine here from All Steelers Talk and Sports Illustrated. He's going to be doing all talking about that with us. Also, all of our wide receiver grades from this past season, who needs to improve the most? What can they do moving forward? All right here in the Locked on Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome to the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, bringing you your daily dose of all things in the Pittsburgh Steelers. As always, you can find this show on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, and YouTube. If you're watching this video on YouTube, hit the like button in the video if you enjoy it. Hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel to get all of our daily Monday through Friday episodes, as well as our bonus content. We thank you for making the Locked On Steelers podcast your first listen every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Got some new changes, though, to Prize Picks. You can pick up to six players, anywhere from two to six players. And if those players score more or less than their Prize Pick projection, you can win up to not 10 times your money but 25 times your money with the new standards that they've set. Go check them out at prizepicks.com. Promo code locked on. Put that promo code in. You can get a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with, again, promo code locked on at prizepicks.com. As I said, we're having a friend back here on the show, Noah Strackvine. You can see him at sportsillustrated.com where he's always covering the Steelers, all Steelers talk, and all the things that they do on that great platform. We're so happy to welcome back. Noah, how you doing, man? I'm, I'm good. And if, if anything, I got to say, what was that, prize picks? I got to yes, go sir. make my deposit because right, FanDuel right. has run me dry too many times <laughs> in these playoffs. So that that cash back max is, is that was a good way to start this. That was a good way to start this show. Let me tell you. Absolutely. We'll get into talking about FanDuel later here, too. But I want to talk to you, Noah, about George Pickens, because we saw him just flash brilliance at times this year. Sometimes, you know, you saw that there was not everything was together a couple of times where you know he wasn't getting as open as you'd like. But man, you know, you looked at the rankings from ESPN and, and saw like he was doing, he had the best grade as far as making tough catches all, all season long. And it flashes the potential for him to, of course, be a superstar. If you're able to make combat catches in this league and do it on deep balls, you have the chance to be an elite receiver. But to be an elite receiver, you have to polish your game. And every receiver knows that Antonio Brown, when he was with the Steelers early on, he did a lot of good things right, but he had to get sharper and sharper to get there. You look at players like Devontae Adams, DeAndre Hopkins, Justin Jefferson, uh, you know, even Jamar Chase, even though he started out red hot, he's getting sharper at his game. Everyone has to improve. If you're looking at George Pickens right now, what's the biggest thing that you want to see from George Pickens improve to be a superstar receiver in his future career with the Steelers? Well, it, it's got to be his catch radius, right? No, I'm just kidding. It's <laughs> it's definitely his route running, I would say. You know, you look mm -hmm. at a guy like Deontay Johnson, who is the most open receiver in football, so it's hard to compare the two. But when you watch Deontay play and then you watch George Pickens play, they're two totally different wide receivers. George is a big body. He's probably the at most athletic guy on the field at all times. But he doesn't really create space very often with defenders, and that's fine as, as long as you could jump over everybody and win those 50-50 balls all the time. But if you want to hit that Justin Jefferson level, that Jamar Chase level, those kind of guys, that Stefan Diggs level, you got to be able to run the routes and create space so that you're you're better, you know, in those shorter routes and goal line, those types of situations. You have more options than just throw it up and I'll probably come down with it. So I, I would say it's his route running, but I, I wouldn't say it's bad. I just think it's for a guy who's already so good, if you could do that, you'll you'll start to enter that that category. And, and I agree with that. I, I also think it's part of understanding how to how to run those routes. Because we, when we yeah. say route running, there's of course there's always different ways to run routes and to make sure that your cornerback can't pick up on your tells to know where you're going. But that also changes with every spot on the field you line up. If you're the X, if you're the Z, if you're the flanker, if you're the split end, if you're the slot, wherever you're lining up. If you're in all those different positions, there's different ways to attack every single route. And the best route runners, Deontay Johnson being one of them, yep. know how to come out of their breaks in ways that make it 
really difficult for defenders to kind of tell, oh, he's running a slant or, oh, he's going to run a comeback here or he's going to run a run a go route. You can sell them on different things. And one of the things I think even before Deontay Johnson, what Antonio Brown did so well for years was when you saw him come out of his break, everything was always looking the same. And he yep. would kind of put you on a point where, dang it, I can't. You know, I can think he's going to the inside, but if I bite on that, he's going to kill me deep. And he did that to a lot of guys and vice versa in different ways. George Pickens, there were times that he beat guys with his routes, but there were also times that I, that was mostly because of his athleticism. And I think just being bigger, faster than a lot of his opponents. I do agree if he's able to master those types of things in this game, which Kenny Pickett did acknowledge in the final uh, post-game presser. He was like, George is getting smarter with how to line up in different parts of the field. If we can improve that, he becomes a bigger weapon in this offense. If It's not just knowing how to line up there and knowing what routes are at different parts of the formations in the Steelers' offense, but how to run the best routes from those positions. I think you're absolutely right. That's the biggest key that you want to see from him. Yeah, 100%. And, and you don't have to hit Antonio Brown, Deontay Johnson level. Like You're so no, yeah, big no, if you're George Pickens exactly. that you just have to be able to get open. Like You have to be able to create that middle-of-the-field space when it's not just, oh, a defender screwed up and now I have three yards on somebody like you could find like, oh, my gosh, George Pickens is wide open. But I don't think that he's ever had to do that. I think that's the thing is, you know, it's hard to say it's a weak spot because it is a weak spot. But how educated is he before he hit the NFL? And I don't think he ever got that at Georgia because he was kind of just told to go run and eat that <laughs> deep ball. Go. They do. They run so many deep balls in Georgia that you're just like, go catch a football, go as deep as you could and jump over everybody. And then <laughs> his final year, he or he's pretty much he out the whole season. Yeah, yeah, so he never gets that de last minute development. So he's he's coming in here. I mean, people got to give George Pickens credit. The dude came in here with one less year of college experience than most people. And if he can learn how to run a route, like he's entering year two, and people are like, "Well, you know, he could be a Justin Jefferson." Like most guys, if That's you miss a year of football, you're not. Yeah, you're not. You're not getting that at all. Yeah, you're absolutely right. If you're being said, if you're in the conversation of saying like, hey, you could be this or you could be one of the best you know, on the in the lines with one of the best wide receivers you know, in, in football. I think that that's that that's a heck of a comparison to be, you know, Justin Jefferson, you know, he's in that conversation with Cooper Cup, with Devontae Adams, yeah, with Cooper Jamar Cup. Chase among being, you know, the, the best wide receivers in football. And, and I think you're absolutely right. Pickens is in the conversation of that. It's just about sharpening his game so he can be that guy. And also sharpening his chemistry with Kenny Pickett because that's also yep. part of it is knowing when to break in your routes because there were times that Pickens would break open and there were times he talked about, you know, there were option plays that they had and they didn't always connect. Sometimes Pickens would run a way that Kenny Pickett didn't think that that was the right way to go. Sometimes Pickens would run the right, right way and Kenny Pickett just wouldn't see it. And I think in the tail end of the season, we saw that work in their favor a couple times. The touchdown pass that he threw to him against the, the Raiders to win the game, uh, yeah. that was an example of both being on the same page, reading what the Raiders were doing and attacking it. And then the touchdown against the Bengals, or the, excuse me, the Browns in this regular season finale was another one where, hey, we saw the same thing. We read, I went, I went, I hit the scene and he found me and it, everything was on the same page. If yeah. they can do that consistently next year, this offense gets an extra gear to it that it didn't ha it really hasn't had it for a, for a few years now. Yeah, uh, and you got to remember that Kenny Pickett wasn't a very good quarterback for like four games, yeah, yeah, and then finished the season like on the verge of becoming a decent quarterback. He's mm -hmm. still not a good quarterback. Like Kenny yeah. Pickett has good parts of his game, and I think that his future is very bright. But I mean, the guy finished with a a decade long are the worst touchdown to interception ratio in over a decade. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's not a quarterback that's going to do many things for his wide receivers. You add a year to that and you, everybody expects that second year jump to come, including myself. I mean, just like you said, that chemistry has got to be nuts mm -hmm. in year two, especially because they, they, at this point, they know each other. I talked to Calvin Austin a couple of weeks ago. He told me that they already have plans for mm -hmm. him, George and Deontay to all go down to Florida and work with Kenny. So, yeah, you got to expect that second year jump. It's going to be, I mean, that's, I think that's the biggest second year jump in Pittsburgh is the quarterback wide receiver connections. No, I'm, I'm right with you on that. I think that that's, that's definitely a big part of it. We're going to talk about my grades all season long for this wide receiver group because 
they're in a, this is one of the more diverse grading groups I have. Like we just did linebackers on the show and they were all kind of like just average. Like no one was super low. No one was, was high at all. Um, you know, some were like a little average to below average, but the wide receiver group was very diverse in how they kind of finished the year. We'll talk about them in just a minute here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. So don't go anywhere. But first, we got to talk to you guys about one of our great sponsors, and that's FanDuel. FanDuel, with the playoffs being here, they're excited to be our new sports betting partner, and we're excited to have them because they're the number one sports book in America. That's FanDuel. New customers, join today, and you can get a $150 in free bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet, all just by signing up at FanDuel.com slash Locked on. FanDuel has all your favorite bets from the money line to point spreads to player props. Combine your your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game, game parlay and all that action on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Football fans, don't miss out. Place your first $5 bet to get $150 in free bets, win or lose, at FanDuel.com slash locked on. And yes, if you place this $5 bet, regardless if you win, if, if you go to, if you sign up, through FanDuel.com slash locked on, you're getting $150 in free bets. So go do that right now at FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, Chris Carter with Noah Strackbine of All Steelers Talk and SportsIllustrated.com. Noah, let's get to talking about some of these grades now. All season long, for those who are you know didn't follow follow this show all throughout the season, we've been we gave great grades for every game for the players that made good and bad plays. If you you got stars for good plays, skulls for bad plays, uh, one skull one stars for like a good play on a decent day, two stars good play on like a, a great play on a good day, and three stars means you had like an elite all pro type of performance in a game in reverse. One skull was like, if you had in like a semi bad day or a bad game, you just, you know, had a bad play and never really redeemed yourself. Two skull means you had a pretty bad game. It was not a good look, you can, but you can get better. Three skulls is like, my goodness, what are you doing out there? So let's get to some of, some of these performances and let's start with George Pickens because um, he had the highest grade on my receivers and all season long when I tallied it up, this man finished with 17 stars and just two skulls. And I was looking hard to look back through like, did I miss anything on, 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 on how many skulls he had to have some bad games. But the thing was, when I look back over George Pickens uh, rookie season, there weren't many games where I could look at and say, man, like he was really not in his, in his bag. He was really having a rough time. He, Drop wise, he had two against the Browns early in the season, um, and then he had one against the Bengals in the, in the rematch, and then one against the Colts. But he didn't have that many drops. And yes, his route running could have gotten better. But how he made his hay all season long, Noah, was not needing to be college open. Just throw it in his catch radius, and he would most of the time bring it down. So I had a hard time picking at him and saying, you know what, your route running's not good enough, man. I'm going to dock you with a skull in this game. Because <laughs> even when he had those type of moments where maybe he didn't pull it in, he eventually brought in a ridiculous catch in the game. Where like either I'm giving you a star for that game or I'm just giving you a neutral grade. And I think that was the best part of him. I gave him an A- minus on the season because he had 15 more stars than skulls. Yeah, and you you look at those two games, the Cleveland Browns, you said early in the season, there was, he got a skull there. He had... Mm -hmm possibly the craziest catch of all time like exactly. in the history of Thursday night football I even and gave him a star for that game because of that catch I'm like so what if he had two drops that's yeah. one of the greatest catches I've ever seen and then he goes to Cincinnati and I know exactly what play you're talking about and I think that was a bad play like I think that mm -hmm. was a you know a, an attitude play where he just right. kind of gave up on the game already but he had like 110 yards and touchdown before that play <laughs> so exactly. it's I mean yeah yeah it's it's a tough one to find He's even route running. Who cares? It's, you know, you can't give him too many skulls. Exactly. It, it, that's where I'm just at with Pickens right now is that he's played well enough to, especially as a rookie, you know, when I, when I look at it, but there, there were few games where I could point to and be like, Hey man, you let your team down. That's yeah. on, that's on you right there. We could go to Deontay Johnson next, but I want to save that for the final segment because we're going to do some things. <laughs> Let's talk about something that's more so funny after the fact. Oh, and that's God. grading a receiver who's not here anymore, Chase Claypool, because oh, I did give him grades while he was here. Now, here's the crazy thing, Noah. 
I, I didn't give him, I didn't crush him at often. I don't think I, he didn't, he didn't have enough time to be crushed. He really, I thought had like some neutral games when he stayed and then a couple bad games, but he also had some decent games on the final score of the year. I gave him four stars for some of his, cause he did have some impressive runs and catches on some games, but he had three skulls. Overall, that's just a C when you only have like one more star than a skull on the season there at Chase Claypool. But here's the joke in all of this. That's what the Chicago Bears <laughs> traded for to give up their second round pick that is now the 32nd pick of the NFL draft, effectively yeah. kind of a first rounder because of the, the Dolphins forfeited pick. It just, when I went back and I looked at it, I was like, I could not talk about Chase Clay. I, I, Clay well, I could just talk about the guys who are here. But no, you know what? That's the guy who the Steelers gave up and, and, and got a, a new pick, a really good pick for them this year. And it just shows, man, like yeah, the Bears b bungled that. But what a selling job by the Steelers to make to put him in that position and then get that payout for him. Oh, my gosh. If, I don't know if you've done all more con grades yet, but that's an A plus <laughs> plus yeah, no. just for that one, because <laughs> that is like that was the steal of the season by a mile. You could say you could bring up whoever or whatever you want. The Steelers way overpriced Chase Claypool and somehow got him because it, like, yeah, he might have a C, which I think is deserved in Pittsburgh. You look at a C like during yeah. his time during the season, he had a good game against Tampa Bay. That was nice. Yeah. Besides that, it was very mediocre, but the team as right. a whole was very bad. So yeah, it's hard to, to grade him. I mean, then what what he goes to Chicago and he has 140 yards and plays seven games and that's pretty does bad. does nothing at all. So yeah. I mean the Chicago grades like an F, if an F minus, <laughs> maybe. And is so the C's the C's nice, and then he just left. So I mean, uh, for the Steelers, that's 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 about an A plus plus plus, possibly. That's the best thing they've done in a long time. Easy. It, it, and especially it, it, if they could pull it, it, out it, something with the 30 second pick. Yeah. And like, that was why like all like in the last like month of the season, I kept bringing that up and people are like, why do you keep bringing up the Texans record and the bears? And I was like, because this team and this team are both yeah. sucking, but this team over here, the Texans might win just one more game. And if they can yeah. pull that out, the bears will be that pick. And then you'll be really happy when you'll be like, huh, that's basically a first round pick for it Chase is. Claypool. Just ridiculous. A first round pick. Yeah, uh, on a guy that you entered the season mm -hmm. talking about after the year are the Steelers. Or actually, bef even before then, you entered training camp thinking, do the Steelers not sign Deontay Johnson so that next year they could sign Chase Claypool? It was a legit well, conversation. Yeah, yeah, it was. And, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, And they, I mean, again, Omar Khan, A++, easy. Absolutely. Last grade before we go to the break, and and, and then we start. We'll we'll talk about Deontay Johnson's grade in a minute here. But I wanted to go over a guy who showed a little bit of promise in camp, and then just kind of didn't get to kind of work it work it work itself out. Was Gunnar Olszewski o on the year? I gave him only one star and then two skulls. Uh, you know, he had the fumble against the Patriots, which, you know, as a return man, he was supposed to be kind of the secure guy who locked everything up there and didn't make mistakes. And that mistake might have cost them the playoffs. Like if you think back to it, like that fumble, if he doesn't fumble that ball at that point in time, the True. Patriots may not get that score. And then the Steelers are playing more. So they're playing more. So like, you know, they're playing the keep a keep away from the Patriots and maybe the Patriots don't get those points. And then the Patriots don't get to run the ball to run the clock out at the end of the game and the Steelers find a way to win. And if they win that game, they're 10 and seven. They have the tiebreaker. They get in over the, 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 the dolphins in that situation. Um, and you're talking about a completely different season at that point. So I won't, I don't want to say it to put too much on Gunnar Olszewski because you could also point to Kenny Pickett's oh, yeah. back to back interceptions in the dolphins game. You could point to not stopping Zach Wilson in the jets. You could point to, you know, their first loss to the Browns. You could point to a blocked field goal against the Ravens. There's so that's the thing about this team. There were so many different points where if one thing happens, they're in the playoffs, but still I felt like Gunnar Olszewski, you and I were at, spring spring practices when they were getting used to minicamp and we saw how much he was cutting things up should there be a place on this team next year for Gunnar Olszewski to be that depth guy who can help as like the fourth fifth option on this team as a vet guy I don't know that's a tough call I do think that Gunnar flashed in what he was asked to do this season and I agree with mm -hmm. you I think you know even coming into the season you talk about the kick returning ability and everybody's focused on that but I thought Gunner was the most impressive wide receiver outside of George Pickens through the entire summer. Like the guy was wide open 
yeah. every single time he talks. But I was told at the beginning of like spring ball, be careful because once the pads come on, he's not the same person. And I think you saw that, like he kind of just yeah. faded away. I don't know what the problem was. Maybe it's just because he is a smaller guy. Um, but you know, they weren't really utilizing him as a wide receiver. What I will say is that he was probably the best blocking wide receiver in Pittsburgh this season made some really good blocks, like some huge, the, the last game against Baltimore yes. in Baltimore he took out two that, dudes. Two dudes on that on that outside run. I don't even remember who had the football. I think it might have been Najee Harris, but that that was the best block I've seen all season. And he had a number of those. So I think, yeah, like if you're a guy, if you're a team and you're looking to build a core, Gunner's a guy that you keep around because even if he doesn't catch a ball all season long, just like Miles Boykin's role, he's a good special teamer when you need him to be. And, and he was like, you could send him out there on punts and kicks and, and expect him to go hit somebody because he's gonna. And, you know, you can put him out there and have him run block. And I think that's that's a very valuable piece to a football team. Absolutely. We're going to talk about Deontay Johnson's grade on the season as well as Steven Sims. And I want to ask Noah, what should the Steelers receiving core look like next year? We'll talk about that in just a minute here on the Locked on Steelers podcast. Don't go anywhere. But first, we got to talk about one of our other great sponsors. And it's one I've already mentioned. And, of course, that's Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the fun new daily fantasy game that everyone needs to start playing Right now, if you haven't played it yet, it's an easy way to get into fantasy sports and get your daily fix by selecting individual player projections and simply saying they'll make more or less than the projection that Prize Picks is giving you. So all you do is pick two to six players, and if you think that you you have a beat on their day in fantasy, uh, Prize Picks is going to give you a number. They say, "Hey, this player is going to score one and a half touchdowns." You think more, you think less. You put that you put that in there. If your two to six players hit, you could have to twenty five times your money on any entry. Check it out by going to prizepicks.com. You're not competing against others. You're just competing against prize picks. And so you're not putting together entire rosters of players and then competing against thousands of people. You're just saying, hey, these few guys, I know what they're going to do. And this isn't just NFL. They also do NBA, NHL, MLB, college sports, on a bunch of different things. So go to prizepicks right now or go by downloading them in the app on your mobile device or go to prizepicks.com to sign up to play daily fantasy sports. First time users receive a 100% is deposit match up to $100 by using the promo code Locked on. That's L O C K E D O N, all capital letters, all one word at prizepicks.com or in the prize picks app. Check out prize picks today. Back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm Chris Carter here with Noah Strackbine. Noah, let's talk about Deontay Johnson. Um, let's do it. Be- because I gave him on a grade this year a C. In my and when I looked back over my weeks, nine stars, nine skulls, because there were times that I thought his route running was exceptional. The guy finished without a touchdown, and people were like Chris, that should flame him. That should flame him immediately, right? And I'm like, well, wait a second. How many of those situations were about him? And there were some, which is why I gave him nine skulls in the year, because there were times that he was dropping passes he shouldn't have. Uh, and the Jets game was one of them. In fact, if he catches that touchdown against the Jets, do A, do they win that game? B, does Mr. Trubisky ever get benched this season? And, and C, what does it change for the trajectory of the offense? Um, and there were times that he, he let the team down. But especially – in the later weeks, he was a consistently open guy for Kenny Pickett to help figure out the tough moments. You look back at Atlanta, 10 targets, five catches, 60 yards. Baltimore, in, in even in the first matchup, he eight targets, six catches, 82 yards. The Panthers game, 10 targets, 10 catches, 98 yards was really important there. And then against the Raiders, seven targets, five catches for 64 yards. He was a guy that I think got open enough the problem I think that that they ran into was Kenny Pickett as he was developing, he was he he was trying to not stare down receivers and you know looking at his primary option I think sometimes took him away from Deontay Johnson in situations. But I think next year Deontay Johnson with his route running ability, the Steelers will work more opportunities for him to kind of make plays downfield and get kind of college open as he can with his route running ability. And that may be another level of Kenny Pickett's chemistry that we see develop to expand the passing offense. Yeah, I think a C is pretty spot on for this season, but I wouldn't expect it to stay that low moving forward. Just like you said, think about think about all of Ben's great wide receivers. Antonio Brown, they had a un- unbelievable connection and he was a great route runner. Unbelievable connection. Um, Juju Smith-Schuster, 
They had an unbelievable connection there, especially early. Yeah. Um, Heath Miller, unbelievable connection. Heinz Ward towards the end of his career and mm-hmm. right before the Antonio Brown era. Unbelievable connection. Um, San, San Antonio Holmes. I almost said San Antonio Holmes. San Antonio Holmes. <laughs> Deontay Johnson. Like, it was so rhythmic. It was so yeah. – the timing was so spot on at all times. Kenny did not have that at the beginning no. of the season, but you didn't expect it because he never worked with Deontay during the summer right. and he was brand new to the NFL and got thrown in at halftime of a Jets game. And then his first start was against the Bills. And then his third start was against the Eagles. And at that point, you're thinking, OK, like, yeah, how much worse can this get? You can't expect good things to come out of those situations with a new quarterback. And you definitely can't expect a wide receiver whose entire game is based off timing yep. to be productive in those situations. Once things started slowing down for Kenny, once they started working together more, you saw that chemistry come. And I think that grows next season because, you know, like we know, Deontay Johnson is the most open wide receiver in football, according to some crazy ESPN stat. But you got to believe it because you watch him and, he is. He's always open. So as long as Kenny can get that timing down, I mean, those two will have a great connection. I'm not worried about it at all. It's just a uh, can Kenny continue to develop? And, you know, is Deontay Johnson ever going to slow down, which I, I doubt it, at least not right now. No, I, I feel you on that. And, and I talked to Will a bit before the the the. the the social media hype around any time that he posts uh, something, I'm just like, everyone relax. He does this every year. <laughs> Did he block you? He blocked me. I don't know. I don't, no. I don't know. That. I don't even know why he blocked me. I'm like, I'm actually one of the nicest people about Deontay. <laughs> I, don't call him, I don't call him Deontay drops in like a lot of people do. It's just, oh like, yeah. Like, like, but, but I also like, I don't feel disrespected by it. That's just how Deontay is. Like he, 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 blocks out a lot of noise and he goes to work. That's what yeah. he does. I, I don't, Dude, he is don't the definition of the wide receiver tweet like all those yeah. memes you see of like the wide receiver tweets my enemies move with a knife in the midnight <laughs> or whatever like that is uh, Deontay Johnson thinks that 24 7 it's who he is mm-hmm. it's and like you talk to people and ask people around him and he says the same and they say the same thing they're just like dude that's just like what his that's just what he's thinking and like everybody else does the same thing like you're telling me you've never posted something motivational that's like a little cryptic exactly. and you're just like real fired up in the moment and then you're just like uh, that you know, maybe I that doesn't look great to some people's eyes, but to me, I'm just like super hyped, like for some super odd reason. And for him, it's the fact that he's you know a professional football player, so he's yeah. allowed to be hyped up at all times. And that's all. That's all that is. No, I feel you on that. And I, the last thing I'll say about Deontay Johnson, I, I think that he's faced a special challenge in his career in that when he came to this team in 2019, he was supposed to pair up with Ben. He never got Ben. Ben was out yep. after two games and was Devlin Hodges and Mason Rudolph. Then in 2020, you see him start to flare up with Ben and then Ben's knees kind of get worse. And then he, his arm decays. And then in 2021, he gets old man, Ben. And now he has Mitch Trubisky and a rookie quarterback. He's never had a chance to be with a prime NFL quarterback in their prime. And yep. I, I think that if Kenny Pickett develops into that, you'll see a lot better of Deontay Johnson. Let's get to the last grade I have here, and that's Steven Sims, who I finished with five stars, no skulls in the season. Because really, when I look back, the only time where I think that he made a couple of mistakes, I think he fumbled the play, he also made a big play to balance it out so he would get like a neutral grade on those games. But there were plenty of times where he would just make a little play here and make a little play there that helped the Steelers, whether it was on uh, jet sweeps or like a catch down the middle. The catch he made against the Ravens was fantastic in that push that, that Kenny Pickett had to get that game-winning touchdown at the end, at the end of the game. I, I think Steven Sims has made the case – to be one of the like, if they don't bring back Gunnar Olszewski, that's one thing. Steven Sims is young, hungry, and I think that as a return man and a receiver, you bring him back to keep working with Kenny Pickett. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that you know, there's a lot of people out there talking about the NFL draft, and I know you're going to ask me what the wide receivers should look yeah. like next season. I think that's a big debate. Is do you add another wide receiver? Because I think Steven Sims made a case for himself to be just like a solidified piece of the puzzle. And then you'll get Calvin Austin back and he's pretty much the same thing. Definitely better if he's healthy, but I I mean, Steven Sims did enough in my eyes. He's a, he's a good return man. You're not expecting much from him whatsoever in the passing game, but when he gets the opportunity, he delivers, which is Mm -hmm. huge. He's great on the end arounds. And we all know the Steelers love their end arounds. Yeah. So, 
you know, you just keep you keep them in that very tiny role with a chance to play special teams. I mean, I, I think, yes, I, I loved what Steven Sims did this season. I thought he was the perfect end of a true wide receiver because he had the Miles Boykin and the Gunnar Olszewski who were just kind of like, yeah, if Gunnar wasn't taking an end around, he was blocking and all Miles did all season was block. But Steven St- Sims was like the end of the actual wide receiver depth chart. And I thought he fit perfectly there. I feel you on that. So let's get to that question that I alluded to and that you mentioned there. What should the Steelers wide receiver room look like? Look like? Because obviously Deontay Johnson's there. Obviously uh, uh, George Pickens is there. Obviously yeah. Calvin Austin will be coming off of injury. And then there comes the question, is Steven Sims part of this equation? Is Gunnar Olszewski part of this equation? Is Miles Boykin? And if you keep all three of those guys – can you really add another receiver in the draft unless it's like a late draft pick and then you have them battle out with those guys? Because a lot of people are saying, Jordan Addison, get this guy, get that guy in the, in the early rounds. And I'm just like, I-, I don't think you understand. I think the Steelers need to invest in other positions and they've got assets in the receiver room that I think Kenny Pickett will be more than happy to work with. Should the Steelers add, even if it's not the first or the fir- or the second, or the, the, either the first round pick or the first second round pick, should the Steelers add to this receiver room via free agency or the wide receiver, or should they run it back with this crew and use their assets to to get to better prepare their other groups? I, I want to say, I want to say yes. I think that the Steelers should add a wide receiver, just because I think Calvin Austin's a question mark because you don't know, you, you know, know, he's he's a fourth round rookie and you feel really good about him and you felt really good about him in the summer, but this the way this just thinking the way the Steelers think. You know, that doesn't mean anything to them. They could care less. That's a guy who's never played an NFL down and they have no idea what he's going to bring to the table. Right. And that's how they're going to approach the situation. They're going to hope for the best, but they're not going to guarantee anything. Um, On top of that, he played a lot of outside in college. So you don't know Mm -hmm. how dominant he's going to be in the in the slot. And I'm sure he's going to be just fine, but they don't really have a true slot guy at all. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're going to hit anywhere, you go and get a, a slot guy like Jordan Addison. And just kind of say, I mean, you have Kenny Pickett, so you have that excuse. You know, no matter how they approach the offense this season, if they get a wide receiver, Kenny Pickett is the reason, and that's okay. Because you're not going to be like, oh, you know, it's a bad thing that you brought more talent for your developing quarterback that you're hoping turns into the next Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, whoever, you know, who are also surrounded by ultra talent. You know, and I think because of that, yes. However... You know, if you're if your thought is if the Steelers are thinking rebuild the offense through the offensive line, that's the smarter way to go. And the Philadelphia Eagles are a prime example of that. You yeah. get a great offensive line. You could do anything you want in a football game. So if you're going to replace the left side of your offensive line, yes. If you're going to go do something like, I don't know, go bulk up your cornerback game. I could see making the argument for wide receiver. I hear you on that. We'll see if that will, there'll be a lot more talk about that, about, about wide receiver, because they could make a move in free agency or in the draft yeah. to address that position. I know there's some people out there that are saying, what about Juju in the slot? Yeah. We'll, we'll have a lot of time to discuss how that happens. Juju's got a playoff <laughs> game. We'll talk about that playoff game tomorrow when we're on the Locked On Steelers podcast, because I'll have Jenna Harner back. She'll be back off vacation, and we'll be happy to talk with her about all the playoff matchups. Noah, thank you so much for joining us here. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Let people know they can find you follow you and get more of your work. Yeah, no doubt. Always a pleasure coming on. Noah's track find on Twitter. You could check all of our work out at all Steelers, uh, dot com, And then you could check out all Steelers talk anywhere. You get podcasts or on our YouTube channel, all Steelers talk. Absolutely. Do check out Noah's track find. He is awesome in what he does. And we're happy to talk football with him. We'll have him back soon to talk more Steelers here. I'm your host, Chris Carter. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Carter Critiques. Check out this show, the Lockdown Steelers podcast on all podcasting platforms, especially on YouTube. If you saw this video on YouTube, like the video, subscribe to this YouTube channel, get all of the daily Monday through Friday episodes, as well as our bonus content. Thank you for making the Lockdown Steelers podcast your first listen every day. You can also read my work at the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, where I cover pit athletics. And in fact, soon after this, I have to jet to the Peterson Event Center. Be because Pitt's taking on Wake Forest tonight. If you want to read about that, you can check out myself and Noah Hiles' work on that in the Post-Gazette tonight. Or, well, excuse me, Wednesday night going into Thursday morning because you're most likely checking this out on Thursday. Anyways, thanks. We'll be back Friday with Jenna Harner right here on the Locked on Steelers podcast.